Welcome to another in the series of Outstanding Leaders in Dentistry, a project of the USA section of the International College of Dentists. This morning we are privileged to welcome to the set Dr. Peter E. Dawson, clinician, educator, author, administrator, father, and grandfather, and a very heavy disciple on quality dentistry. Pete, welcome. Thank you, Dick. You know, these tapes are kept in the National Museum of Dentistry in the visiting scholar room of the library. And we will um, have them for people to see and use in their research and so forth. Now that I've got rid of all of those little details that I need to say, how was mom and dad influenced in your life? Well, I was very fortunate in having a wonderful family life growing up. Uh, my dad was a laboratory technician, dental technician, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. We had seven kids and just a wonderful family life. We had a little family orchestra, and my dad would bring home uh, friends or clients from the lab, and my mom was always ready to cook dinner. We sat down with 11 people at our dinner table every night at 6 o'clock because we had two grandmothers that lived with us. And it was, it was really a wonderful way to grow up. And I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, which was a little town then, and just a great place to live. Orchestra, what did, where did you fit into this? Well, I played the saxophone. Okay. The alto sax. And my mother played the piano. My sister played the accordion. My brother played uh, guitar and mandolin. Uh, and my dad hummed. <laughs> and uh, the rest of the kids would sing. And we had a great time. It was, a, it was really a nice way to grow up. So early on in your life, you had a little impact maybe from the profession of dentistry through father. Did he, uh, did he start to give you an idea that that may be where you'd end up? Oh, I'd say he was responsible for my interest because uh, uh, at age 13, he invited me to come and work with him at the lab. Uh, and I started out as a delivery boy, and I got to take uh, the cases around to the doctors and at that time, all the dentists in town were practically in one building, which was about a block from my dad's lab, downtown St. Pete. Uh, but I got real interested in what was going on, so he made me a plaster monkey. And that's where I started in uh, mounting and pouring models and uh, in working with uh, vulcanite repairs wow. and things like that. Uh, then I would... Uh, my dad would work uh, long hours, and he'd come home for dinner, and then most nights he'd have to go back to the lab and work further. So a lot of times I'd go back with him at night, and then there's just the two of us there. He would show me how to do a lot of the different procedures. So uh, as, I, as I look at what you're saying, those were pretty happy days for young Peter Dawson. Oh, they were great, yes. I loved it. I loved it. I loved the laboratory. I, in fact, I wanted to be a technician, and I told my dad that's what I wanted to be. He told me, well, first I'd have to go to dental school. <laughs> and if I went to dental school and I still wanted to be a technician, that he'd give me the lab. Uh, so I guess by the time I was in the seventh grade, I knew I wanted to be a dentist. Your brothers and sisters, uh, anybody else into the profession at no, this point? No, nobody else in the profession. Okay. No. Let's go in now to the grade school and the high school. Were there those people that you can significantly say had impact on your life through those young, young years? Um, oh, definitely. I think so. I went to a Catholic school. I went uh, 12 years to the same school, first through the 12th grade. And uh, I had particularly a nun who had formerly been uh, uh, a uh, editor at the New York Times. Really? And uh, she really inspired me to write, and she was a fabulous teacher, and there was a lot of inspiration there. I was the editor of our yearbook through her, and uh, I think that's where I got my interest in, in writing. And of course, at a Catholic school, you learn grammar and English. And discipline. And discipline, right. <laughs> yeah. the, the 
the, the knuckles get wrapped if you didn't yeah. do things and right. And so then that led you toward college. I went to St. Petersburg Junior College. Okay. I went for two years, uh, and then I was accepted in dental school. I was one of the only students in my class at dental school that didn't have a, at least a BS degree. Uh, but uh, I did get in at a time when there were probably 4,000 applicants for my class of 80. I still don't know how I got accepted, but I'm sure grateful that I did because my dad died very suddenly of a heart attack when I was in high school. And so with uh, four kids in college at the same time, uh, I pretty much had to work my way through. Uh, and uh, so I didn't, uh, I was grateful that I could get into dental school after two years of college. Your father passing away early, the lab stayed in the family or? No, the lab was sold then. I see. And uh, uh, the man that had worked with my dad from the time he was 17 bought it and took it over. And uh, it was Dawson Dental Laboratory and then it became Carlson Dental Laboratory. Now, high school then, uh, through the junior college, how did Emory get into this? I know you went to Emory. <clears throat> Why Emory? Well, Emory was about the only dental school in the southeast then uh, that uh, you could go to. Florida didn't have a dental school. Okay. And Florida did have uh, a program where Emory would take 20 students a year from Florida, uh, and then Florida would subsidize that education. And I'm sure that was a help in my getting accepted at Emory. Dental school, interesting topic. Uh, what, what were those days like for you for those four years of uh, dental education? Was that a satisfying year, a frustrating time? Uh, how, did you, how did you look at those years? Well, I frankly really enjoyed them. I, I loved dentistry from the time I got started in it. And it was just exciting to be learning it. Uh, of course, having been a technician at that time, I was very familiar with all the dental lab procedures, and so I just could breeze through those uh, courses, and so uh, that was fun. Mm -hmm. It was tough, and we had some really mean teachers that uh, <laughs> Didn't treated us like dirt, yeah. but uh, <laughs> we survived, and uh, I felt like I got an extremely good education at Emory. I had some excellent teachers there, too. Any particular names that come to mind that were um, significant in your early career in the, in the school area? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Arch McEwen uh, was head of Crown and Bridge, and he was uh, the father of high-speed dentistry. He was the one that got uh, put all the extra pulleys on the hand pieces and got them up, and he told us that one day uh, we would live to see uh, dentistry being performed at 25,000 RPM. Uh, at the time it was 2,500. Yeah. Uh, and of course when I got out of dental school and went into the service, it was went to the Air Force, uh, we were working with belt hand pieces that sure. went 2,500. So I can recall those days <laughs> <Yes>. myself. <laughs> uh, dental school then was a good time and you chose to pick the U.S. Air Force and uh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, how, did you, how did you go in the Air Force? Where did you go and were those good <clears throat> years for you? Uh, well, I, I picked the Air Force because at the time they said we could uh, pick the location we wanted to go to. Uh, I picked Europe and ended up in Korea. <laughs> it's close. Uh, uh, although I had a really interesting thing happened when I went in uh, to, I went to Tokyo to, from there to go to Korea. I had my orders written to Korea and if it was a terrible time in Korea, it was right at the end of the Korean War. Uh, I went by to see the clinic at Tachikawa because a friend that I'd gone over with had uh, been assigned there as a physician. And I met uh, Colonel Bill Franklin, who was the CO of the dental clinic there, and everybody had said it was the finest dental clinic in the Air Force. Well, I went in and met him, and we just had an immediate chemistry. Uh, and I told him that I had grown up in a dental laboratory, and they had a big lab there. Uh, and he said, well, let's go into the lab, and let me show you what we have. And so he picked up a bunch of work and asked me questions about it, and I apparently answered him okay, because uh, we went that, then went back to his little office, and he said, let's have a coffee. And 
while I was there, this fellow came in and tossed his papers on the, on the desk and said, well, I'm here. And the colonel says, is that the way you were told to report for duty? And he says, oh, come on, colonel, you know. And, uh, and then the colonel told him that he likes his uh, dentist to make a presentation once a month to the rest of the dentists, and he wants them to be members of the ADA. And the dentist said, well, I don't want to belong to the ADA. And the colonel said, well, you don't have to if you don't want to. He said, well, the fellow says, you know, I think I'm going to like it here. And the colonel says, you're not going to be here. And he said, well, this is where my orders were, sent, uh, were sending me. And the colonel says, well, your orders are being changed. You're going to Korea. <laughs> and on the spot, he changed my orders where I got to be in the finest dental clinic, I think, in all the Air Force. And it was a marvelous experience. And I was there a short time when I had done a couple of crown preparations. And the colonel came to me and uh, asked me if I had done those. And I said, yes. And he said, you know, I'm going to make you a prosthodontist. And so he made me a crown and bridge prosthodontist, and that's what I did for two years in the service. And, and that I, got you into the prosthetic, but you would, you would like prosthetics all along. Yes. When I went to dental school, uh, I went with the idea okay. of getting into crown and bridge because from my lab experience, that's what I wanted to do. Right. But I had a wonderful mentor, uh, Colonel Ralph Bates uh, in the Air Force, who was a prosthodontist, and he worked closely with me. And I had the opportunity to work uh, with the lab technicians and actually evaluate uh, the, the partial denture cases that were coming in. And then I would write letters to the dentist who was sending them in from outside the, uh, the base. Okay, it, was a central, it was a central dental laboratory. And so I would tell them that we need both models if we're going to make the partial and things like that. So I got a real insight into yes. how uh, dentistry was being practiced. Right. But St. Petersburg was always in the back of your mind, wasn't it? And you oh, went yes. back there. Yes, I wanted well, to go back to St. Petersburg and practice. And I went back and opened my own practice, uh, bought a little, uh, rented a little space in a strip, uh, practically built my own office because I didn't have any money. Uh, and I had to borrow, of course. I already owed on my dental education. Sure. But then I had to borrow to start my practice. So I started with one chair. and uh, But I had the first high speed, the, the Page Chase handpiece. Oh. I had the first one of those in Florida. And you know, it just changed the whole face of, of dentistry to be able to cut teeth without all the vibration and the heat and everything. So I built a practice practically overnight. People were just flocking in. In fact, I ended up with too many patients. Then I had to resolve that. But that practice you built up, the five dentists or uh, numerous <coughs> uh, setups. Eventually, yeah. five uh -huh. dentists, yes. Let's change pace just a, a, a quick time in here because I want to get the important part of your life in there, the family. Tell me the days, the early days before Jody and then how you met and, how, and what happened for the last 45 years. Well, uh, I was a bachelor all through my service career, and then when I went into private practice, I, uh, I went by to see an old friend, uh, Dr. Charlie Martin, and he introduced me to everybody in his office except the cute hygienist. <laughs> well, of course, that piqued my interest, and so one of the other gals in the office introduced me to Jody, and uh, I think it was kind of interest at first sight. and. Uh, to make a long story short, why we got married uh, within about a year of that time. And uh, boy, she's been a wonderful, wonderful partner through the years. We have four children. Uh, I know you have three girls and a boy. Now, what are do. they doing these days? Our son, Mark, is a banker. He has four children. Uh, Ann, our oldest daughter, works with me at our center okay. uh, and has now for a lot of years. She's a wonderful help. Kelly is our daughter who lives in Atlanta, and she has a boy and a girl. Her husband is a youth minister, and she teaches special education. And our youngest daughter is a hygienist. Uh, she lives in Charleston with her husband and a little boy and girl. So they're counting up eight grandchildren. Right. 
and um, the apple of your eye, I'm oh, sure. Oh, boy. Yeah. Love those grandkids. How are they split up, uh, boys and girls? Are they? Uh, uh, well, the two daughters have a boy and a girl, and my son has three boys and one girl. Okay. Well, I know that's the, uh, the limelight for you because I, I can relate to that myself. Okay, uh, as we know, the wife and the, the kids are certainly a, a central part of one's career, and it sounds like Jody really sort of made you. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me then talk about, as your practice grew up to the four or five dentists, and then you, you started the thoughts of, of starting uh, maybe teaching people the skills and the knowledge that you had. How did those things come about? Uh, those were a while ago, but I'd like to know the uh, initiation of that. Well, actually, it was a long time before I uh, started to grow the practice in number. I, uh, after my second year in practice, I did go into partnership with another dentist, and we uh, both uh, agreed that we wanted to uh, specialize in uh, crown and bridge and complete mouth reconstruction. I actually hired a technician my first year in practice. Uh, and work with him. That was Paul Mua. And Paul ended up uh, writing one of the top books on dental technology in porcelain. Uh, but we, uh, we had our own dental laboratory and uh, we got involved with uh, occlusion through Sig Ramford. In fact, I got involved early with Sig Ramford from University of Michigan. Perry Dunst. Periodontist, yes. uh, but also uh, one of the leaders in occlusion. Yes. And, you know, I thought I knew what I was doing with my crown and bridge dentistry and you know, the experience I'd had and all, and I'd, I had done quite a bit of crown and bridge dentistry and thought that it was okay. But then uh, Sig Ramford came down to St. Pete and met with, uh, there were about five of us, I think, uh, and we actually learned how to equilibrate occlusion. Well, boy, that was an eye-opener because then I went back and started looking at my work and finding these interferences in there and correcting them and getting the wow factor in my patients saying, why didn't you do that in the first place? <laughs> and I recognized uh, at the time that, hey, I had to learn a whole lot more about occlusion uh, and also the temporomandibular joint because at that time, uh, really, people didn't know that much about the TMJs. But we were solving all these so-called TMJ disorders. Uh, and not all of them, but most of them. Uh, and so I started thinking, well, occlusion is the answer to everything. Uh, well, the more you think that, the more problems you find because mm. it's not the answer to everything. We th then learn, well, you know, we've got to make a proper diagnosis of the TMJs. And if there's a problem there, we have to solve that before we get into occlusion. So, started really becoming interested in that uh, and solving a lot of headache problems and sore teeth problems and all that with a uh, better understanding of occlusion. Well, a lot of my dental friends then that we talked to say, well, show us what you're doing. And so they just started coming to my office on weekends and I would show them how to equilibrate and just share with them what I'm doing. Well, the next thing you know, I'm spending every weekend at the office with little groups and they're come, starting to come from all over the state. So uh, I didn't start out to be a teacher, it just happened. Uh, uh, a group came from Orlando one day and uh, that is called me and asked me if they could come and there were 12 of them. I said, you know what, there are just too many people here. I'm not going to do this anymore on weekends, I've got to spend time with my family. So we'll do it during the week and we'll go out to the beach and and we'll, we'll get a hotel out there and we'll have a little seminar. Well, by the time uh, the time came, there were 35 people lined up. So that was my first seminar. So you started doing <clears throat> these in your office around in the 1961 or so yes. in that mm -hmm. time frame. Mm -hmm. Let me just interject, who were the other people? I know Sig Ramford, you say, was very significant in your early days in private practice. Are there other names that uh, pop to mind? Oh, yeah. Uh, L.D. Pankey was a tremendous influence on me. Uh, very early in my dental career, I went to Miami and took a course from L.D. on practice philosophies, one of the first courses that he gave. And uh, again, we had some 
uh, just some immediate chemistry between us because it was a short time later that LD called me and asked me what I was doing on a certain date. And I said, what do you have in mind? He said, well, I'm getting a few people together and I'd like for you to come and join us. We're just going to have a little session and talk about some things that are going on in dentistry. So I said, well, I'll be there, whatever it takes. Uh, well, I went and it was uh, Clyde Schuyler and Arvin Mann and John Anderson and you know all these people that I'd Big heard about. Biggies. And I'm this young guy sitting there wondering what in the world I'm doing there. But it was a wonderful opportunity to uh, be influenced by a lot of people that were making things happen. Uh, and out of that, uh, Clyde Schuyler and I became real close. Uh, and then, of course, the Panky Institute got started pretty much with a lot of those same people. And I was involved in the early years with that. And you're still involved. Well, I the... just I just had, uh, I just spent last week at the Panky Institute my 25th year, oh. and they refer to it as Dawson Masters Week. Yes. Uh, but this was my last time. I said this would be the last 25 time. 25 years. I would do that, yeah. You have impacted so many dentists throughout this country and internationally through L.D. Panky's uh, Institute, other than, of course, your own. But mm -hmm. Okay, then, then let's move up to the time when you became a, a, an author. In about 73 or so, you, you um, wrote your book. Well, my first book was published in 73, but it was a 10-year oh, okay. effort writing it because uh, I was doing it. I was working full time and then going home brain dead. At the, <laughs> <laughs> and always, uh, I always made a commitment to the kids. When I got home, that was children's time. So uh -huh. uh, then I would, when they would do their homework, I would go in and start doing my writing and a lot of times work till the middle of the night. Uh, so it took me a long time to write it, but the reason that I wanted to write it is because I felt there was a lot of misinformation about uh, temporomandibular joint problems. Uh, you know, at that time, and amazingly still, some people are thinking there's still a psychosocial disorder, and we were finding, no, they're a cause-effect disorder, a lot of times, uh, most of the time, muscle. Uh, and there were a lot, of, a lot of things about occlusion that were being misinterpreted, and I just felt that I wanted to write uh, what we were doing and try to set the record straight. Well, it turned out that it was, uh, uh, when that book was published, it was immediately the bestseller in dentistry and stayed, still it stayed is. that way, yes. Still is. The second edition is still. The second edition now is in uh, 10 or 11, 12 languages? 11 languages, 11 yeah. languages. Mm -hmm. Well, the impact that that book has had has just been totally tremendous. Okay, so then we move. Um, about to 1979, when actually the Dawson Center for Advanced Dental Studies was founded and and opened. Yes. Give us some impression of that, because that has an impacted on thousands and thousands of dentists. Well, uh, this was really the result of feeling that uh, dentists today should be the physician of the masquetory system. There are so so many things that dentists should be doing and can be doing that they aren't doing and yet I felt also that there was a great need to learn a lot more and that it should be a multidisciplinary uh, uh, effort and so what I wanted to do was put together a group of top-notch specialists who would work together and share together and see each other's results and who would be committed academically to the literature and to research, and uh, so we moved to a new office, which I, I was involved with building a building, and uh, so we had an opportunity to take two floors in the building and just bring in all these specialists who would be committed to teaching and sharing. All still in St. Petersburg. All still in St. Yes. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Well, that really has worked out phenomenally well because out of that, and of course, by now my practice has grown to well, four dentists, and uh, then the other practices, the specialty practices, were autonomous, but were part of our combined teaching effort there and sharing effort. Uh, and, and I referred to it as a think tank. 
a multidisciplinary think tank for dentistry. And out of it has come a lot of really good information and, and new ideas and classifications and I think teaching methods. Our goal is to, to try to share what we learn in, in a way where then people can go out and uh, work with the schools and all that and carry that information. I, uh, I'd like to read a statement here from Dental Economics, and I'm going to read it so I don't mis, uh, misstate it, by Hugh Doherty. The mission of the Center for Advanced Dental Studies says it all. To search for the truth, to understand its rationale, and share what we learn. The enthusiasm of the students at the center indicates that it's filling a much-needed void for dentists that are in search of clinical excellence. Thank you, Pete Dawson, for providing such a place. Clinical excellence, I know, has always been your byword. Absolutely. And the, the impact you have on these people, how, does this, how do these people draw on the research that they're doing in practice? Because this is practical stuff. This isn't just something pulled out of the sky. And then you're able to put it together, validate it, and present it to the profession. How does that happen with all the group? I know your faculty is how many? A uh, bunch of people. Yes. I don't uh, even know how many. We yeah, well, <laughs> 10 or 12. And they do their own clinical research on patients mm -hmm. and bring it well, into it's clinical. It's clinical research. And, uh, but it's uh, backed up by intensive study of the literature and anatomy and physiology and listening to everybody. Uh, for years, we would invite people who we disagreed with to come and present, and then we could have our discussions and say, well, maybe uh, we've learned a lot from people that we thought we disagreed with, but we have to keep an open mind about these things. Uh, but then we could evaluate it both clinically and look at it from an anatomical standpoint and a biomechanical standpoint and all these things. So we feel like we, we really have a good understanding of why the things we do work, uh, but we're always trying to subject our beliefs to the scientific method and uh, just begging uh, some of the uh, research facilities and graduate programs and all to take what we do and study them uh, because we are, in a, we are in a clinical situation and we, we have to take care of our patients so we can't, we can't do the double blind studies you know in fact it's very difficult to do double blind studies anyway yes. on occlusion and some of the things that we do. So you did an extra uh, educational endeavors in anatomy of the TMJ and, and uh, all sorts of things to make sure that you did know what was going on. Yes, and some of the beliefs that we had originally turned out to be wrong. Uh, as an example, in centric relation, we used to shove the jaw back. We'd put the thumb there and shove mm, back. Most retruded. Yeah, most retruded. Yeah, that I was the definition. That, yeah. that was locked in. Yeah. Uh, well, I, inv I invited... Um, uh, Dr. Harry Zitcher down to St. That's Petersburg right. yeah. because uh, he, I'd become a friend of his through the American Equilibration Society and there was a big discussion. Well, why is centric relation the most retreated? Well, everybody thought it was because the ligament stopped the condyles from going back and uh, so I asked uh, Dr. Zitcher if uh, he would come down and let us dissect together so I could really see that and it was during that dissection that it became very obvious to me that all of the muscles, the elevator muscles, are behind the teeth and they elevate the condyle and the condyle would go up the eminence when the muscles contracted and if you pushed back from that point, there was no muscles to pull it back any further. If you pushed it back, the condyles had to go down to go back from that uppermost position. That was an apex of force position, which I think defines it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Well, what it told me was that, hey, we were, we were calling centric relation the wrong thing. It wasn't the most retreated. It was the most superior. So once I saw that, and incidentally, the ligament isn't even involved in centric relation. It isn't until you've really shoved the jaw way back further than it should go and down. Once I saw that, I thought, well, you know, if, if the muscles are going to elevate the condyles when the jaw closes and it's not fully seated when you adjust the occlusion then when it does go there your back tooth is going to be interfering 
So I went back to my patients that I had gotten so-so results on, and I started elevating the condyles rather than shoving them back and readjusting their occlusion, and the patients would just say, wow, boy. And you could see the change in their musculature and everything, just their facial expressions. I thought, well, this has got to be the answer. So then we started doing a lot of study on it. We developed a research clinic through our county dental society, and I founded it with uh, three other dentists and was the first president of it, Fine House County Dental Research. And we invited uh, dentists from all over the Tampa Bay area if they had a TMJ problem, they could bring it to the clinic. We combined, we combined that, we had a nice clinic, we combined the, our research facility there, clinical research facility, with study clubs, and we also worked on indigent patients and set it up as a dental, labor, dental assistance uh, teaching program. So it had a combined effect. But then working with, uh, I worked with uh, 10 dentists a year in my group, uh, and we would have them learn how to do the centric with our bilateral manipulation, which I developed to get that uppermost position, and then we'd compare mm -hmm. results, uh, and we'd also compare repeatability and such things as that, and uh, it just became very obvious to us that that was the right place for centric relation. Well, that was a hard thing to convince a lot of dentists of in the Equilibration Society and such as that. In fact, I remember one of my first presentations uh, at the AES, uh, American Equilibration Society, when I mentioned seating the condyles up and then load testing to make sure they were there. And a very prominent dentist ran up on the stage when I was finished and grabbed the microphone and he shook his fingers at me and he says, young man, you keep shoving that jaw up like that and one day you're going to run those condyles right into the brain. <laughs> well. I thought, could I do that? <laughs> and I went back and got a little more interested in the anatomy and found out, well, you can't do that, uh, and that it was the medial pole that was stopping the condyles from going up, not the, not the roof of the fossa, the medial third. Well, that changed a lot of things, too, in our understanding of how the disc fits in there. So uh, the point here is that by seeing what was happening, happening clinically, and then going back and doing the dissections and seeing, oh, now where does this fit? Uh, we were able to really affirm uh, that what we were doing was, was the right thing. Well, then it ended up that a, a group of us just put together uh, an organization called Occlusal Focus. Uh, Niles Gachet was involved, Frank Salenza, a number of people that had been involved in nathology and occlusion and all. Mm -hmm. And we decided, well, we wouldn't have any presence, we wouldn't have any notoriety involved. We would just get a group of 40 of the top dentists in the country and get us all together, uh, and we'd hash this centric relation thing out. Uh, and that's what we did. We, we went out to Las Vegas, uh, and we spent three days and three nights uh, discussing. Every discussor had to give his opinion. And then it would be discussed by an anatomist or another, somebody who opposed. And then we ar arrived at a consensus. And we left that meeting with a new definition for centric relation. Uh, and then it was written up. And uh, that was, I, I don't remember the date on that. It's been a lot of years ago. Uh, and since that time, most people certainly uh, have changed their way of taking centric and uh, at, at don't call it most retreated position, but I'm amazed that some people haven't gotten that message yet, even though it's been many that years That may have ago. been one of the few committees that came out with some consensus in yeah. our profession, <laughs> and I congratulate you for it was that. A, it was a hundred percent consensus by the oh, end of that, that meeting. That's amazing. But at the beginning of it, uh, Niles Gachet said, uh, after the first day, he says, you know, if we leave this meeting without at least one heart attack, it'll be the miracle <laughs> of the century, because there was a lot of shouting going mm -hmm. on. But yeah. As we started to reason together and look at the anatomy and the physiology and the biomechanics, there wasn't any other conclusion we could draw. And everybody came away with that understanding. And I think it had a major effect oh, on all we do in dentistry. Yes. Let's switch just another little uh, sidelight here to uh, your uh, attitude of serving the profession has been obvious for a long time. And you also have been involved with many, many 
organizations, but the, been the past president of several. Um, the, the American Equilibration Society, American Academy of Restorative Dentistry, American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, Florida Academy of Dental Practice Administration, just to mention a few of them. And you still had time to do all this other stuff. How'd you do that? In retrospect, I don't know, Dick. I, <laughs> because I also made a real strong commitment to my family sure. on, on uh, weekends were family time. Yes. But uh, in fact, we bought a little cabin in the woods and we'd go there every weekend and uh, had a nice stream running by and we'd swim and fish. And, um, and uh, that, my family was still always the number one. I, I think. I think what I didn't do is I didn't watch a lot of television. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how many hours a day get wasted, uh, you know, with, with just watching television. And uh, if we just took that time, it's amazing how much you can get done in a couple of hours a day if you concentrate on, on uh, some guidelines of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Well, of course, the, your, your emphasis on family is certainly the top priority for many, many people and is uh, so also one of mine. And I know that your girls and your son have appreciated that and uh, they're always around. So that's, yeah. that must mean they liked it. And so within this time frame, though, you also started after you got your center started in 79, you started to being recognized throughout, and you lectured extensively in the United States and uh, in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any of those uh, situations that stand out as being uh, not only fun, but uh, had impact on your studies of uh, any nature? <clears throat> well, uh, I guess one of the, I, I did talk at just about every meeting yeah, going, I and uh, uh, I've just, felt uh, a passion, you know, to get the word out and bothered by misinformation. Um, I guess one of the, the most important of those meetings was uh, in the early 60s, I, th I guess it was in the 60s, I presented uh, the concept of a customized anterior guidance to the, uh, I guess it was a Florida dental meeting. Uh, it might have been the ADA meeting that was held in Miami. But uh, at that time, uh, we had, had learned from Clyde Schuyler. Clyde Schuyler was a tremendous influence on, on me through Panky. Panky introduced us, and, and then by now the Panky Institute was uh, getting, getting going. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clyde Schuyler uh, influenced us to start thinking about the front teeth. And so with the anterior guidance, even, it, even being a uh, standard uh, position of 30 degrees laterally and a little steeper forward, but working out the front tooth contact and then LD built in functionally generated path and the posterior teeth to get them out of the way. Uh, and it worked so well because at, at that time I had also been studying with Charlie Stewart and Peter Thomas and Boy. all those nathologists, you know, and, and the the uh, fully, ad uh, full adjustment in fully adjustable instrumentation. Uh, well, uh, Clyde Schuyler wanted us to do the 30 degree lateral anterior guidance. And so I started doing that and getting really good results, except my patients were complaining that uh, sometimes they couldn't get their lips together and the teeth would be out too far, too long in order to keep that flat anterior guidance. And so I started experimenting with customizing the anterior guidance and worked out a, a four-step procedure uh, for customizing it. Well, then we had to work out a process to make the posterior teeth so they wouldn't interfere with that sometimes concave anterior guidance. And uh, so when, when I worked that out and presented it, a lot of people jumped on it immediately. And, and I... Uh, in trying to work out the anterior teeth so they fit in the neutral zone and some of the concepts that we found were tremendously important, we were just getting exceptionally good results now with, with almost immediate acceptance from anything we did with the front teeth and then the back teeth were doing better too. So an uh, interesting thing came out of that in that Clyde Scotter was upset with me for changing that anterior guidance. And uh, so he... He would, uh, he would fuss. He says, you know, it's hard enough to get these boys. We, everybody was boy then. <laughs> he 
He says, it's hard enough to get these boys to do it the simple way. He says, you're going to get it so complicated that they can't do it. And I said, well, Clyde, I said, it, it really works. And he said, well, I'm going to come and watch you, watch you do it. Well, by then he had moved to Naples. He would get on the bus in Naples and come over to St. Pete, and I'd meet him at the bus station at 7.30 in the morning. Now, he's in his 80s. He would come over and stand by my chair all day long and watch me do this. And then I'd take him to dinner, put him back on the bus, and he'd head back to Naples. Well, he did that several times. And he never would agree to me with me that it was acceptable. Well, before L.D. Pankey died, why well, he was going through a bunch of his papers, and he ran across a letter from Clyde Schuyler, which he sent to me. And in the letter, why Clyde said he had just been over to visit Pete, and I watched him do that anterior guidance thing, and he says, I hate to admit it, but I think he's right. <laughs> but I didn't want to tell him, because it's going to make everything too confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the things that are really important to those the people that are practicing. See, that's so many times in dental education we forget that there's a patient there. Yes. And, and those are the significant things. Now, because of all this lecturing and because of all the, uh, and of course your book, the best-selling book out in the second edition in all these countries, you've received many awards. And I know it's tough to uh, talk about yourself in this area. I'm going to mention a couple of them because I know that it's important. Um, the Dean's Award for Special Achievement from Emory, which is certainly the Distinguished Alumni Award, knowing that your peers have uh, all those guys that you've known for, they knew how you were in dental school, a lot of those fellows, yeah. and they gave you the Alumni Award from there. New Orleans, Hinman has given you their Medallion Award, which is uh, the best thing in, in uh, the Southeast, and of course Florida, and throughout the country, are there any of those awards, I, I didn't go into the list of them because we need to finish the tape, but are any of those significant more than others to you? Um, they're all certainly wonderful recognitions of your achievement and your contribution to the profession. Uh, well, you know, they, they all are meaningful in that uh, it, it, it means a lot to me that people really respect what I'm teaching and all that. I have to tell you, I'm not big on awards. I, I don't, I don't seek them, and I, I'm a little embarrassed by them to tell you the truth. A lot of times, I, I would just as soon be low key and just teach what I teach and and not worry about those things. So, uh, well, but, you've had you've had numerous, numerous, and I'll mention it for you since you won't. But let's now go back to your teaching. I know that you were professorial lecturer at Georgetown for 25 years mm -hmm. until the school closed. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that occur that you, you travel from St. Pete's up to here to Washington and lecture and then go back? I mean, that's a heck of a commute. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting story because when I went to that session that I told you about that LD invited to me early on, I met Jerry Cortad. Well, Jerry Cortad had uh, worked with Carl Sinell from Europe and developing some parallel pin procedures. And boy, I immediately jumped on that because that would, uh, we didn't have good adhesives then. So uh, we could then make partial coverage restorations without showing a lot of gold. Uh, and of course, there was a lot mm -hmm. of perioprosthesis being done then because we also didn't have good implant concepts. Uh, and so we, Lent the teeth together. Well, with the use of parallel pins, it just opened up all kinds of new doors. So I got in heavy with uh, parallel pin retained restorations. And then Jerry Cortad was invited to teach at Georgetown on pins uh, with Carl Sinell. Well, then the two of them asked me, would I join them? And so I went there and put in my two cents worth at the session with the three of us lecturing together. And then they had me actually prepare a three unit parallel pin bridge, uh, which I did on closed circuit TV and, and all. Well, then Carl Sinell left and Jerry Cortad decided not to do it anymore, so uh, I ended up with it by myself. Well, in talking about doing bridge work, I couldn't do it without bringing in occlusion. Because I said, now don't do these bridges if you're not going to build them to correct occlusion. 
Well, then the classes wanted more on occlusion. So what started out to be a three-day class on pins ended up being a three-day class on occlusion with a one-day class on pins, and then we just did away with the pins and just started teaching occlusion. And I invited Jim Cosper, uh, who was L.D. Pankey's partner, to join me, and Jim and I taught together at Georgetown for, for 25 years. Uh, yeah. That's what you call yeah. De yeah. dedication. Yeah, it was, it was a great time too. We had some wonderful times there at Georgetown. Yes. Well, let's let's um, then. We know you you spent some tremendous time here in Washington, and uh, fortunately, your air your your air wasn't as hot as most of the air we hear around this city, and you were impacting a lot of young dentists. Let me now switch to a couple areas which I, I I'd like to hear your comments. I know in the past, and I've read of some of your uh, articles of about your concern with the dental education process that's going on right now in our schools. Mm -hmm. I am concerned, and, uh, and I, I'm a friend of the court on this in that I recognize uh, that there is a tremendous void right now in uh, positions that are being, not being filled in dental education. And I just can't commend those dentists enough that will dedicate their lives to teaching in the dental schools. And, and uh, uh, I don't want to come across negative in that regard at all. What my concern is, however, that, uh, well, two concerns. First of all, I want, uh, and we encourage the dentists who come through our center and start to have a better understanding of occlusion and differential diagnosis and total masticatory system dentistry. Uh, I encourage them strongly to go back to their dental schools and offer their services as uh, clinical instructors and such as that to help fill that void. Uh, I also feel that there's a need for the dental educators in the schools to practice. Yes. And yes. the schools that are, that are having a clinical practice program within the school uh, I think are doing a better job. And I think that that can be the answer or at least one of the answers to filling the void of teachers uh, if, uh, if they can be allowed to practice and supplement their income. Sure. Uh, so I, I think there are solutions to the problem. Uh, I guess the main concern that I have as far as the results uh, is that the dentists that are coming through my classes uh, seem to be knowing less and less and less about the things which I think are extremely important, and that is occlusion and differential diagnosis. Uh, not just of temporomandibular joint disorders, but of orofacial pain and all the things that we as dentists should be treating. And the reason that I feel that the dentist must be the physician of the masticatory system is because there isn't any other medical specialty that addresses the masticatory system. They, they don't... We're, Dentists are the only one who have, or at least should have, an understanding of the total masticatory system, of occlusion, of how occlusion relates to the temporomandibular joints, how it relates to masticatory muscle disorders and such as that. And if, if the dentist can't differentially diagnose specific dental problems or, or problems that are within the dentist's purview, who's going to do it? And, and so what we have seen through the years and, and I'm, we've seen an awful lot of it as patients that have been mistreated uh, and misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all, uh, who could be helped by the general dentist mm -hmm. on, a, on a very practical basis. But the dentists don't even know, many of them, most of them, don't even know that there's a relationship uh, between occlusion and the joints and all of the masticatory muscle problems that present as headaches and sore teeth and excessively worn teeth, and fractured teeth, and abfractions, and all the, the occlusal disease problems that are related to disharmony of the occlusion, the typical dentist that I'm seeing today is not understanding how to resolve those, and yet they're very resolvable, and they're resolvable on a very practical basis. So the, prof so the t schools aren't teaching it. I don't want to generalize on that, because uh, yeah, some are, I, sure. I know some are working very hard to teach it properly. But for the most part, what I'm seeing in the recent graduates is it's the rare 
dentist today out of dental school who has any basic understanding at all of occlusion. In fact, we've been asking the question uh, of all the people that come to our classes, you know, how do you, how would you relate your education in occlusion? And the typical answer is uh, one or two lectures, or they mentioned it, or very limited, and it's the rare dentist who says, I feel like I got a good education in occlusion. And then even there, when we question them about specifics about it, they very often have a very limited knowledge. And yet, it is something that's learnable, and I think the, that the dental school is a place that it should be introduced because there are skills required uh, that have to be learned, and what better place to learn them at, than dental school? That's, that's, a, that's a concern of a lot of us that have gone to schools that produced clinical dentists. Yes. And now we're a little concerned that the, the, the bottom line is the patient isn't getting the care they deserve. Not only that, but what I'm seeing now is because dentists don't have a good enough understanding of occlusion and, uh, and the, just the basic concept of masticatory system equilibrium, that all the pieces have mm -hmm. to fit together, that you can't isolate the teeth from the joint or vice versa. Uh, and with the masticatory musculature, which is responsible for so many of the orofacial pain mm -hmm. problems that patients have, so many of these patients are getting treatment that actually is detrimental to them. I mean, we have dentists now being uh, sucked into uh, bioelectronic methodologies that end up over-treating patients. And we're seeing this right now. We're seeing a lot of dentists uh, raising the bite, 28 restorations that weren't needed, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's malpractice. But yet they don't, they don't know that what they're doing is actually harmful to patients. But we're seeing those patients, and I get reports all the time from dentists who are seeing these patients yeah. too that are in trouble, and then they have to go back in and take forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of dentistry out of the mouth to correct it. Uh, I know for uh, that we have talked that uh, you do offer uh, the full-time faculty people at mm -hmm. universities the opportunity to come and study with you. We invite that uh, yeah. for many years. Uh, we've invited any full-time faculty member of any dental school to come as our guest. We charge no tuition or anything for any of my classes. You may get more after this tape. <laughs> oh, I hope so because, you know, that's one of my passions. I want to see better dentistry being taught. Uh, not only do we have the problem it's not being taught, we have the problem that occlusion has been downgraded with very severely flawed literature that's being quoted over and over again, that occlusion doesn't have anything to do with much, you see. Uh, uh, particularly TMD has been one of my major... What is that? No, I, well, no I, you asked the right no, question. I know, I hear it so you, much. Sure, but I, you, know, you, you asked the right question. What is TMD? Well, TMD is not a syndrome that includes everything from the waist up. But that's <laughs> yeah. what it... Uh, I mean, the NIH uh, depiction of this as published in, by the NIH is, is includes everything from popping, clicking joints to sore teeth to headaches, to back aches, neck aches, uh, and other disorders. You know, they're just everything lumped into TMD. Well, we don't have to, we don't have to uh, do that anymore. Uh, that early on, when we didn't know anything about the TMJ, uh, well, then it was a syndrome because we just didn't know. But today, we can very specifically diagnose and classify every disorder of the of the joint. Basically, we want to break it into intracapsular disorders, mm -hmm. uh, and when we there, there's structural disorders, and so many of these patients are being told, well, it's just a psychosocial problem, it's a stress problem. Uh, no, it's not a stress problem. That's, uh, that isn't to say that stress doesn't contribute to it, because it does. But we find structural disorders there that are easy to diagnose and classify. We use a Piper classification that can pin it right down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. Uh, and so we can tell exactly what's going on. There's nothing can hide from us anymore. With the imaging technologies that we have today, we don't have to guess what's going on in that joint. And the same thing with occlusion. So the research studies that are quoted over and over again talk about TMD. Even recent articles in jury journals mention 
Occlusion has nothing to do with TMD, but they don't depict what kind of TMD. Occlusion doesn't have anything to do with a sarcoma of the joint, doesn't have anything to do with rheumatoid arthritis of the joint, although the joint then affects the occlusion. You can't have, you can't have instability of a joint without having instability of the occlusion, or vice versa for that matter, you see. So we have, we have to clearly define the type of TMD we're dealing with because occlusion plays a dominant role in some of those, particularly what we call occlusal muscle problems, disorders. That's, that's an occlusal problem, uh, and, and we have to be clear in defining that. But when we have the journals coming out repeatedly saying occlusion has nothing to do with TMD, but TMD isn't defined, and the occlusion isn't defined, what they're typically uh, those articles use uh, angles classification. And I know some huge sums of money have been paid on research that shows occlusion has nothing to do with TMD when the occlusion was never related to the TMD, TMJ, using angles classification, which doesn't relate the occlusion to the joint. <laughs> yeah. How can you study something like that? When, and all these things are achievable. That's why I, I did recognizing that problem, I did come up with a new classification system that relates maximal intercuspation to both the position and condition of the joint. And that's a simple classification system, and that did get published in Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. I know one of your passions, too, is the inability to have people understand what good literature and research are and how they interface. Um, not many do dental schools they, I'm talking a few years back, did not teach how to actually understand the literature and if it is in fact good research. And I don't know how you do that very well, but well, it's, it is a problem. It is a problem, and it isn't a simple problem. Uh, now, I'm a, I'm a literature nut. I mean, I really love the literature, and I subscribe to a bunch of journals, and I read them. Uh, and Fortunately, just because of the position I've been in dentistry, I've gotten to know a lot of the different researchers, and I've also gone to the trouble of checking in on a lot of their, their research and all. But a good example is, a, is one of the studies that showed occlusion had nothing to do with TMD, and it's repeated over and over again. Uh, and the, the study used a mock equilibration and compared it with a so-called real equilibration to TMD. Well, this, this is quoted over and over again as a double-blind study. And it's said it's an example of evidence-based research. It's really an example of horrible research mm. because TMD wasn't defined as to the type of problem and the occlusion, the mock equilibration was compared with a real equilibration that wasn't even completed in one appointment and they said right in the article that they didn't complete the equilibration. Well, if you don't quit a complete an equilibration, you're going to activate problems, you see. Well, then they used a kinesiograph to evaluate the results, uh, saying that, well, that's scientific measurable information. No, no. Kinesiograph has been shown by experts that it has a specificity of 0.2, which means it's wrong eight out of ten times. Yeah, pretty bad odds. So how can you take a study that's so seriously flawed and repeat it over and over and over again as proof that occlusion has nothing to do with TMD. But that's what we've been up against, and we continue to be up against it. Yeah. Now, the typical dentist reading that literature would be very impressed with it and say, oh, well, this is really a good yeah. double-blind study. And even as late as the July issue of Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry, a whole group of authors cite this as being an excellent example of evidence-based writing. So. The, the literature on this is so seriously flawed that something has to be done about it. Let me ask you a question. The door knocks on Dr. Peter Dawson's office. Here are two young students standing there, and uh, they're thinking of going into dentistry. They say, Doctor, um, what do you think? Should I go into dentistry, or, you know, or should I, I hear all these things? What should I do? What do you tell them? I tell them there's never been a better time in the history of the universe to be a dentist. I see the opportunity in dentistry as just being unbelievable. And I see, I see this as something that's being missed uh, by a lot of people 
uh, as saying, well, you know, when we got rid of decay, uh, we need fewer dentists. No, no. I can compare. When I started in practice, half the people that came to me had either lost their teeth or were getting ready to lose them. Uh, it wasn't a stigma then to lose teeth. Uh, today it is. Now look, we've got fewer dentists, we've got a tremendous increase in population, we've got all these baby boomers coming along who still have their teeth, and they've had them long enough now to have a lot of problems, uh, and they don't want to lose them. And we have this tremendous increase in aesthetic dentistry that we're capable of doing so beautifully today, we have ways of keeping teeth, and we have a population that wants good health of their mouth, can afford it, and will do it. And fewer dentists to do it, and fewer dentists that have an understanding enough of the total masculatory system to do it properly. Uh, and so I see the opportunity for any dentist that wants to develop a quality practice and when I talk about quality practice, I'm not talking about what I usually refer to as smell me dentistry. You know, <laughs> I, I'm talking about quality dentist, dentistry for every patient that sits in that chair. Every patient that sits in that dental chair deserves a complete examination. And they deserve to know everything that's wrong in their mouth that has the implications of becoming worse if it's not properly treated in a timely way. I think they also deserve to know if they have implications of problems that are of immediate concern uh, and if they have problems that are deferrable and if they have problems that are optional. So they can decide, but they need to know, deserve to know, if they have problems in their mouth that should be treated. You can't know that without a complete examination. Uh, and, you know, there are things that if you let them go, they're just going to get a whole lot worse. We're going to need a lot more dentists than are being graduated today to take care of those problems. And if they're doing 15-minute exams uh, and not seeing the problems, uh, well, and, and trying to see 40, 50 patients a day, <laughs> uh, they're going to be missing so much that all that's going to do is result in more and more problems in the future that are going to have to be taken care of. And then some of this full mouth laminates on 28 teeth building up the bites and putting them in the wrong jaw position is going to create all the more de demands for dentists who know what they're doing to bail people out of this mess. See, so I, if I were one of these kids, I'd say, I'm going into it. Oh, it's a <laughs> marvelous profession. I, I look at it as the greatest hobby in the world. There you go. Yeah. Speaking uh, of hobbies, what, you're busy in the Dickens. What are your hobbies? Well, I love golf. Uh, I, I play tennis in the summer, but not in the winter. I'm just too busy in the winter. I take my summers off and uh, move to the mountains. We have a home in Highlands, North Carolina, uh, and I play golf four or five times a week. And I don't do any lecturing now during the summer because I use that time to write. Yeah. I, and I, I'm working on a 20-volume uh, master's library of complete dentistry. And that's part of the center, is it yes, not? Part yes, part of the center. Mm -hmm. uh, I but know it, that you have good commentaries in the center on your web page. I've enjoyed reading some of your, uh, the, the, what's new and the commentaries that you include in that. Mm -hmm. it just, just if people would read that, they would gain something without even coming down to St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay, let me ask you one big question too. What is dentistry going to look like in 2025? 2025, uh, well, you know, a lot of the things that we believe so strongly in, such as getting equilibrium of the mastoid system, equilibration, equilibration that's gotten such a bad name, uh, everybody is not an equilibration uh, patient. Uh, we, there's five ways we have, we have of resolving occlusal disharmony. Uh, equilibration is just one of them. Uh, and that's why we use mounted diagnostic cast to see can we equilibrate a patient without uh, mutilating them. But equilibration would save patients an awful lot of problems by getting a harmony where they're not then wearing their teeth out, knocking them loose, and creating all these problems. 
those are very simple things that we can do that negate the need for major comprehensive dentistry later on. So I, I see if, if dentists will learn to do those basic things to get mouths healthy, uh, you can actually minimize a lot of the dentistry that is needed later on. But I think with uh, adhesives and improved laboratory procedures, the aesthetics involved, uh, hi, it's just an implants, osseointegrated implants being as, as good as they can be today, uh, it's just, uh, there's almost nothing that we can't do in dentistry today. And some of the corrective surgery that's being done on the joints is just unbelievably good. Uh, uh, building up bone where it's gone, uh, just, uh, it, it's just almost nothing we can't do in dentistry today to mm -hmm. restore a really severely broken down mouth. I think it's going to take at least 25 years just to get caught up to where we're, what we're capable of today. <laughs> okay. What do you see for the center from now on for the next several years? You got some new uh, things that you're going to develop there at the Center for Advanced Dental Studies? We're primarily working with uh, training dentists to uh, have an understanding of occlusion and differential diagnosis of uh, occlusal problems and orofacial pain problems mm -hmm. and temporomandibular joint problems. There's a tremendous need for it. There's tremendous interest in it. Uh, the dentists that come there and study at the center are tremendously enthusiastic and, you know, it's word of mouth, so they just send sure. more. So we stay very, very busy and booked up in advance there. Uh, and uh, we have some marvelous uh, teachers that are actually doing the work. You know, they're working with this multidisciplinary group and, and studying a lot together and have a lot of answers for these people when they come. If you look back at the, the time when your dad was certainly a, a major impact in your life in the dental profession and how you got where you're going and of course your family and your uh, service career getting you going in some of these areas, all throughout your authorships and your clinical excellence and your center in 1979, if I ask you what Peter E. Dawson wanted to be remembered for, what would you say? Well, it might surprise you, but it would be being a good dad and a good husband. Hmm. I would put that above everything else. Hard to, hard to disagree with that one. Well, we have had just a, a delightful time here, and I so much appreciate in the USA section as you as a fellow of the college, appreciate very much coming out of your busy schedule. And I know, because I've been trying to get you up here for a couple of years, mm -hmm. that you've taken time with Jody to come up to Washington and sit here and discuss some of these issues that you feel strongly about. And uh, I really appreciate it. It's been a privilege. Well, it's my privilege. Thank I you, sir. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. We appreciate it all, and we hope that God continues to bless you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.